Honors Biology 1, Second Quarter Review. This is part one of two. Remember we started off the year with cell theory and cell types, and the three parts of the cell theory are all organisms are made of cells, the cell is the basic living unit of organization for all organisms, and all cells come from pre-existing cells. This is based on observations, and using inductive reasoning, we tied a, a whole bunch of different observations together to form theories, and that's how theories are formed by observations and experimentation. Here we have the um, information about the differences between the two different cell types we find in nature, which are prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Now keep in mind prokaryotes are much smaller and simpler in their um, complexity. Prokaryotes don't have much more going on other than having DNA to code for proteins, some ribosomes to make those proteins, and the enzymes that carry out life processes. Now they do have cell membrane and have also a cell wall for protection and a cytoplasm, liquidy interior, but they're much less complicated than eukaryotic cells. Remember that prokaryotic cells include the single cells of bacteria. All of them are unicellular. A hint to help you remember is pro means no membrane bone organelles, such as nucleus, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, lysosomes, vacuoles, mitochondria. All of those are not found in prokaryotes. Pro means no membrane bound organelles and nucleus. Now, of course, pro means before and karyote means a nucleus, so we're just using a mnemonic trick to kind of help us out. Eukaryotes include the cells of plants, animals, and cut off here are fungi and proteins. So all of the um, multicellular organisms like plants and animals, as well as most fungi and uh, some proteins, are eukaryotic. And as you can tell here, we have a lot of uh, different organelles inside a eukaryotic cell. These are the cells that contain membrane bone organelles, like nucleus that holds the DNA, uh, endoplasmic reticulum, both smooth and rough VR, Golgi, lysosomes, vacuoles, mitochondria, cytoskeleton. Now keep in mind that um, both prokaryotes and eukaryotes have some things in common. We have, and bacteria have, a cell membrane. They, we both have uh, DNA, and we both have a cytoplasm, a liquidy interior. Also not listed here are ribosomes. Ribosomes, remember ribosomes making proteins, are also found in prokaryotes as well. Take a second to review the, the similarities and differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Pause the presentation now. Here we have a generic animal cell. This is not what all animal cells look like. It's just a representation. There's about 100 different types of animal cells in a human body. However, it does have all the features most cells have. We have a cell membrane, we have a nucleus, which is a membrane-bound sac for our DNA, mitochondria, we have Golgi apparatus here, rough ER dotted with ribosomes, smooth ER, and um, some other things like lysosomes, and uh, not all cells are going to have like a flagella like this, but uh, we're going to go ahead and review some of these inside structures now. Remember plant cells have basically the same thing animal cells, we're both eukaryotic, they have a nucleus just like us. They also have a few additional things. They have a large central vacuole for storing water and ions, and they also have a cell wall. We don't have a cell wall. Uh, we just have the cell membrane, so that provides some extra protection and support that we don't get. Also, remember plant cells, in addition to have mitochondria, don't forget they have those too for cell respiration, they will also have chloroplasts, the green parts of a plant that do photosynthesis to make sugars out of carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight. All right, here we have a review of some of the uh, structures found inside eukaryotic cells. Remember, a nucleus is going to be involved with uh, controlling the rest of the cell's activities. They're going to contain the DNA. Basically, the DNA codes the uh, codes for making proteins, and proteins carry out all the life processes. And that's how the nucleus acts as a control center. Mitochondria, that's going to be involved with cell respiration, basically converting glucose, a stored form of chemical energy, to a more usable form called ATP. So we're basically breaking down glucose to make ATP energy in the mitochondria by the process of cell respiration. The ribosome, remember ribosome, ribs have proteins, and what do the ribosomes do? Make proteins. These proteins can be things like enzymes that carry out uh, chemical reactions, lower activation energy. Here we have lysosomes. Lysosomes, uh, the prefix lys means break apart. Lysosomes are basically the recyclers of the cell. They have enzymes inside to break down damaged organelles, and they can also break down things like food particles with those enzymes. Chloroplasts found in plant cells and some proteins are the other one of two organelles that are involved with bioenergetics, making energy. Chloroplasts basically convert light energy into chemical potential energy stored between the, uh, the 
the bonds and atoms and the sugar molecule. So basically a chloroplast is going to be the part that does photosynthesis, which is using light to put together carbon atoms and hydrogen and oxygen to make glucose. The glucose has stored chemical energy that can be used for doing things like um, making ATP by the mitochondria, and we're going to be converting light energy into that stored potential energy within the glucose molecule using carbon dioxide, water, and light. The endoplasmic reticulum, we've got two of them. The endoplasmic reticulum that's rough, or rough ER, is dotted with little ribosomes. And if you remember, ribosomes make proteins, so the rough ER is going to be making the proteins that are going to be exported out of the cell. For example, insulin is made by the rough ER and then sent out of the pancreas cells into the bloodstream. We also have smooth ER. Smooth ER is not going to have any ribosomes dotting it, and um, smooth ER is involved with detoxifying poisonous compounds as well as uh, making all the phospholipids for the cell. All the membranes, the cell membrane, all the membrane bound organelles, they got the membranes from the smooth ER. The Golgi apparatus is the second organelle that uh, is involved with um, sending proteins out of the cell. Once we make our proteins by the rough ER that are going to be exported, then the Golgi apparatus modifies those proteins, gives it a chemical barcode, basically tells it where it's going to go chemically. The cell membrane controls what goes in and out of the cell. Remember, it's a semi-permeable membrane. Some things can get through, some things can't, made of phospholipids. We have the vacuoles down here. Vacuoles are basically just storage areas, like closets, that hold different things, like water and food particles. Cytoskeleton, it's the internal skeleton structures that kind of hold things in place inside the cell. And a cell wall. Animals don't have cell walls, but plants do. And a cell wall is going to be providing uh, protection and support to plant cells. Now, don't get cell wall confused with cell membrane. Cell membrane is not very strong. It controls what goes in and out. A cell wall will give additional protection and support to plant cells. We have a cell membrane. Plants have both a cell membrane and a cell wall. Take a moment to review the organelles that we learned about in eukaryotic cells. Here we have some helpful Venn diagrams. Again, we have the, um, the compare and contrast of the bacteria-like prokaryotes and the more complicated plants, animals, proteins, and fungi cells called eukaryotes. Here we have the ribosomes listed in the area that we have in common with the bacteria. Also, plant cells have cell walls and chloroplasts that animal cells don't. Animal cells have lysosomes and centrioles that plant cells don't. And look at all the things we have in common with plants. Animal cells and plant cells both have cell membranes, ribosomes, nucleus, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi, vacuoles, mitochondria, and cytoskeleton. Make sure you can recognize the differences between animal and plant cells, as well as bacteria, prokaryotes, and eukaryotic cells. Here we have a transport summary. Remember, this is the cell membrane. We have a phospholipid bilayer, bilayer made of two layers of phospholipids. The inside part here of these uh, this bilayer is very hydrophobic or water-fearing, kind of prevents things that are hydrophilic or water-loving from getting through. Now, if it's very small or hydrophobic, it can go right across the cell membrane. We can pretend this is outside near the blood. Uh, we can pretend this is inside the cell. So this is inside where the cell has its all, all its organelles. So how do things get inside? Well, we have diffusion, which is a natural process, doesn't require any energy by the cell, basically just going from high to low concentration. Just like when we uh, drop that little dye, uh, drop a dye in the water and kind of spread throughout the water just by diffusion, it doesn't require any energy. It's basically just random motion that spreads from high concentration, located over here, to low concentration inside. Some examples of diffusion include small molecules like oxygen and carbon dioxide, as well as some um, molecules that are hydrophobic, like lipids. Over here, we have larger molecules that can't go right across the cell membrane, and uh, this would represent things like glucose. Glucose is a fairly large molecule, C6, H12, O6, 24 atoms, and um, to get that glucose inside the cell, we need a little help from a protein channel. If you need a little help, that's called facilitated. A facilitator kind of assists the meeting, um, and facilitated means with the help of this blue-purple protein channel. Diffusion, again, going from high to low concentration, and that's how that glucose gets into your cell so we can do cell respiration. And if you remember, insulin has to bind to this protein channel for the glucose to get inside. 
Uh, we talked about how you know diabetics don't make that insulin, so the protein channel doesn't open up, and the glucose stays in the bloodstream. So that causes a real problem for doing cell respiration inside the cell for diabetics. That's why they feel tired. Then we have the opposite of diffusion, and this is the only process that we talked about that requires energy. ATP energy, again, that's that third phosphate that's being released from the ATP to make this reaction happen, kind of destabilizes this molecule. Uh, don't worry about that, but it opens up this protein channel and pumps things like sodium and potassium and other ions from low concentration to high concentration. This is called active transport. The active refers to the energy required in the form of ATP in order for this to occur. Keep in mind active transport is like the opposite of diffusion. Diffusion, high to low concentration, no energy required. Low to high concentration does require energy. In living systems, that's usually ATP. Take a moment to review the three methods of molecules moving across the cell membrane. Here we have a description of what happens in different solutions of water. Remember, hypo means under, tonic means solutes, so hypotonic means less solutes. And these are always used in comparison to another solution. So here we have a cell membrane, semi-permeable, separating the inside water from the outside water. The outside water is described as hypotonic, or less solutes. Less dissolved stuff like salt and sugar means it's more pure water. Water moves from more pure to less pure by the process of osmosis. Remember, osmosis is diffusion of water. So the water is going to go from more pure to less pure, hypotonic to hypertonic, and eventually the water enters the cell and lyses or destroys the cell. And that's why you don't get a pure water to transfusion. Over here, plants have a cell wall, so when they get that extra water, they don't burst. The cells just become turgid, and basically that causes the plant to stay upright much easier. Here we have isotonic. Iso means same. Tonic means solutes. So your blood is isotonic to the red blood cells. There's an equal concentration of water on both sides. So the water is moving in and out of the cell in equal um, amounts. And basically the cell is in its normal environment, which would be your blood. When you get an IV at the hospital, that will also be isotonic to the blood and the blood cells. In plants, if they are put in an isotonic solution, water moves in and out equally also. However, the plant starts to wilt a little bit in that solution. They kind of uh, work better in a hypotonic solution. The last type of solution, represented by a darker color, is hypertonic. Hyper means above. Tonic means solutes. So this means more solutes compared to the cell. And that means that the cell water is hypotonic compared to the sugar, salt, or the other tonic uh, solutions on the outside. So if the water is more pure on the inside, then the water is going to move from higher concentration to lower concentration by osmosis. The water leaves the cell, it shrivels, it starts to die. And that's why you don't drink salt water in the ocean. Over here we have the plant cells put in a hypertonic or higher uh, solute concentration on the outside, like lots of salt or sugar. And the water is going to leave by osmosis. Basically the cell membrane here pulls away from the cell wall and that causes the um, plas uh, plasmolysis basically the destruction of the cytoplasm and the cell membrane being pulled away. Here we have the two formulas for, um, for photosynthesis as well as cell respiration. At the top here, remember heterotrophs. Hetero means other, troph means feeder. Heterotrophs only do cell respiration. And in cell respiration, which happens in the mitochondria, and all eukaryotes do this, is to um, take glucose and oxygen. Remember you breathe in oxygen for cell respiration and you release carbon dioxide gas, that's what you're breathing out in larger quantities than you're breathing in, water, which you can use by your body, and energy in the form of ATP. And we have the balanced chemical equation at the bottom here, C6H12O6, one molecule sugar, plus six oxygen molecules, 6O2, yields six CO2, six carbon dioxide molecules, plus six H2O, six water molecules, and ATP energy, and actually 38 ATP is being made. Now, autotrophs can do cell respiration, but they also can do photosynthesis, and you should know this formula as well. And notice that it's almost like the exact opposite. Where we had sugar coming into cell respiration, we have sugar being released uh, as a product of photosynthesis. So here we have 6 carbon dioxide coming in, 6 CO2, plus 6 water coming in, plus light energy. And remember, this happens in plants, protease, and some other things like blue-green algae. Blue-green algae are almost, uh, they have a different slightly different photosynthesis going on. They're a bacteria. 
and then in the process releasing or making one molecule of sugar, C6H12O6, and six oxygen molecules. So notice we have carbon dioxide going in in photosynthesis, carbon dioxide coming out in cell respiration. We have sugar going in in cell respiration, sugar coming out in photosynthesis. Go ahead and review these two formulas, and this ends part one of your review for the second quarter final.